one of the challenges we have is that there's hundreds of chemicals that come on, new chemicals that come onto the marketplace every year. And that's added to the chemicals that have already been registered for use by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I'm actually kind of surprised that today we didn't hear too many people mention the magic 80,000 number, though Dr. Smith did say it's even more than 80,000. So uh, there's various numbers that we have about the extent to which there are environmental manufactured chemicals or chemicals out that we may be, ex that we may be or are exposed to out in our environment. Um, we know that there are uh, at least several thousand that are what we consider in high use, so ones that are used in more used or imported in more than a million pounds per year. So those represent very important opportunities for exposure. Yet when we look at the conventional biomonitoring, and some of the data has been presented today from biomonitoring studies, or the classic is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, we see that really very small universe of the potential chemicals that we can be exposed to are actively biomonitored. So in some sense, as been discussed earlier in the previous talks, we may be looking under the lamppost at things that we've already decided are things that we should be measuring for. So a lot of the biomonitoring studies, they decide ahead of time what chemicals to look for in the biological samples, and then they go look for them. But if we didn't think of the chemical or we don't know that the chemical is out there, then how do we know to look for it? So that's the question we are interested in at UCSF, is to take off on the exposome idea and say, well, what if we actually said, let's just look and see what are the chemicals that could be present in a biological sample, and let's focus on pregnant women, because that's a time that we really care about in terms of vulnerability and susceptibility to environmental chemical exposures. So some of the aspects about why we would choose a approach that is uh, it's an untargeted, I want to say unbiased, uh, but bias implies that there's something wrong with using the approach that we use now, which I'm not saying that there's something wrong with picking things a priori because that uh, turns out to be a very useful way to advance what we know about biomonitoring. But really what we want to see is are we missing things that we have may be exposed to that are not captured through what we have been doing traditionally through our biomonitoring methods. So using a non-targeted approach, we don't decide ahead of time what chemicals to look for. We do a scan to see what chemicals may be present. Um, there has been uh, many of the chemicals that we're interested in, a method has actually not been developed. So we actually don't know, uh, even if we wanted to measure for them, whether they might be present. And so we use this basically approach. So we have, um, through the good fortune of being able to work with Dr. Drona at UCSF, uh, access to an analytic chemistry technique known as time of flight mass spectrometry, which is essentially a, an approach that can do an unbiased or untargeted scan of the potential small molecules, so environmental chemicals, that may be present in a biological sample. So, I'm not going to go into the details of how this works, but I'm going to explain kind of the basics because it's actually kind of cool. So basically, they get the molecule, take the blood sample, which we are taking from pregnant women, get the blood sample, do some kind of chemistry to look at all the little small molecules in there. And Dr. Drona can explain this later afterwards. But we take the molecules and we ionize them. We basically give them a charge. Um, and so, for example, we do something to them that gives them a negative charge. Then we basically charge this plate. So I don't know if you ever had, when I was a kid, I had these two magnet dogs. And when one was negative on this side and one was positive, they were attracted. But when they were both negative, they went boom and fell apart, right? Or they fled apart. So that's the same basic concept. You charge this pulse. And basically, the molecules all leave at the same time from the plate. And the smaller ones go faster and the bigger ones go slower. And we just measure how long it takes, and we use that to estimate the mass based on time of flight. It relates to the name. Time of flight mass spectrometry. This is a technical detail, but I have made a very simple explanation about how this um, analytic chemistry technique works. There's various aspects to it. Just for the purposes of this talk, molecules are made in many different types of ways. Um, the way we are going to focus our initial discovery phase here is to focus on, the, on those that uh, are basically have a negative uh, attribute. 
Okay, so when we do this approach, we take our molecules and we find out how fast they're all going, we can basically use an algorithm that's developed by this time of flight mass spectrometry that gives us an estimate of the mass of each of the molecules that we find in a biological um, sample. Okay, so now you're thinking, well, how do we figure out what those chemicals are? So if you all came in the room and you gave me a piece of paper and I put it in a hat and you told me what your mass was and I went in the other room and tried to figure out who you were, I pretty much would not know. So somehow we have to figure out from all these masses what are their matching, um, what is the matching chemical. And so we have created a database to essentially match the masses to potential types of chemicals that, we, that may be uh, present in these biological samples. And we do it based on chemical structure. So essentially the, the machine gives us a mass. We, um, it also takes a database that has chemical structures, so the molecular formulas. It takes that, calculates the mass, matches up the masses, and then tells us what the chemical formulas are, which we go back to identify what the uh, chemical names are. So. Our database that we've put together includes chemical formulas and which we then match to different types of chemicals. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, this must be a very easy thing to have. How come you have to make a database full of these chemical names, chemical formulas, as well as other attributes that we're interested in? And it turns out that our focus on industrial chemicals is a little bit unique to some of the other databases that exist out in the world, such that we haven't quite found the exact um, chemical database to use for this, for, this, um, for this method. So we've had to create this from scratch. I will say that uh, working with Dr. Girona and the LCMS TOF, it did come, he actually had a database full of pesticides, molecular formulas for pesticides. So our database actually has an overrepresentation of pesticides, which actually has produced some interesting um, effects on our analysis. So our database that we use to try and identify all the molecules that we're finding in these biological samples is focused on chemicals that are high production, high volume, high use pesticides, and identified through other government priority lists. So for example, Proposition 65, high production volume chemicals through US EPA, data that's already biomonitored through NHANES. Our database has 5,000 chemicals. So you can see that we still have uh, a relatively um, small fraction of all the chemicals that are registered for use by US EPA. Okay, so if we apply this to an actual biological sample, what are the kinds of results that we see? So we have a pilot study to test out this application in a small group of pregnant women who are seeking care at San Francisco General Hospital that we work with in terms of recruitment for other studies that we're doing. So the goal is to identify previously unmeasured chemicals in this cohort of pregnant women. Um, we also need to identify, once we identify the chemicals, we then are going to look to quantify the chemicals that are most prevalent. So one other thing that I should mention about this, uh, this TOF LCMS is it gives us an indication of what's present. It doesn't tell us how much is present or how accurate we are in terms of identifying that chemical. So once we get the list of hits, we need to go back and go through what I will call, call the traditional biomonitoring method of getting the standard, developing the technique, and then, uh, and then confirming that what the hit was is actually present in that sample and at what level. And then we're very interested because this particular population actually comes from many locations in Northern California. This can give us a profile of the kind of chemicals that are present in pregnant women um, in Northern California. So as I mentioned, the, uh, went over, I did a general description of the TOF. There's uh, details on how we can group the chemicals somewhat related to their chemical structure. And we are, because this is, a rel this is a new discovery related project, and as Dr. Smith mentioned today, there hasn't been um, much done in this area. This is really uh, moving into new territory. We're focusing on a group within our 5,000 called, we label environmental organic acids. So technically, these have greater than one ionizable protein. So they're essentially have a somewhat acidic acid structure. 
a lot of these are, have a similar structure related to some endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, they include phenols, so this would be like BPA, parabens, nonylphenols, other types of phenols, pesticides, some pesticides, and phthalates are examples, and I'll show you more of the classes that we include in this group. So for this group, we went from 5,000 to 729 that are included in the environmental organic acids. Greater than 80% of these are not actively biomonitoring, which I mean primarily through NHANES. So here are the groups of chemicals that are included in our environmental organic acid group. We have environmental phenols. So as I mentioned, things like BPA, um, nonylphenols, parabens, they're used in a variety of plastics, uh, food storage containers, many different types of uh, products. We have phthalates and phthalate metabolites. I think people are probably somewhat familiar with this group. They can be in cosmetics and personal care products, and also used in plastics, um, cleaning products, and uh, other indoor uses. We have some perfluorinated chemicals, about 52. This is chemicals that are used for stain resistance and non-sticks, so used in fabrics, um, some cooking materials, uh, other types of stain resistant wear. Uh, we have PBDEs, not too many, because uh, they're actually mostly not that acidic, but the metabolites are, and so we have some PBDE metabolites in this group, and that's been discussed. Uh, and then 400 pesticides. So you can see right now that our database is heavily weighted towards the pesticides, largely because of the source of our information. This is the information of the population, the study population. We have 20 women who we uh, have collected uh, serum from. The median age is 23. This population is primarily low income, and in this, while the, the study population that we draw from for recruitment is generally not uh, so predominantly African American, but it's, it's anywhere from half to, in this case, it's 86 percent. So here's the results in terms of uh, looking at the, just the, the number, the total number of hits that we have for each of the participants in the study. So we started off with 700, and you can see the participant here on the left. This is participant one, all the way up to participant 20. And so this participant had 100, essentially 100 different hits that we identified in her, uh, in her serum sample, all the way up to 136. So you can see that it's, we're starting at a baseline of 100 going up to about 140. So here's the results of the types of chemicals that we're getting hits for. So we have a large group of phenols. We're seeing a, about, a tw I, have, I have some more numbers on this, but just loosely. Then we have pesticides, a lot of phthalates, PBDEs, and, or these are PFCs, and then this light blue up here is PBDEs. So when we compare this to NHANES, so one of the things we were very interested in is if we apply this non-targeted approach, is there an advantage to this compared to a sort of traditional biomonitoring methods, which is pick the chemical first and then identify whether it's present in a biological sample. And NHANES is, represents the largest biomonitoring uh, study because it's representative of the United States. So we can see here a comparison of the kinds of things, potential chemicals that we're identifying compared to what is already found in NHANES. So I'll just go over here to the phenols. You can see right away that we're finding um, essentially about, you know, three times more phenols that are uh, evaluated in NHANES, some about double more phthalates, not so much on the, on the PBDEs because we um, don't find, and the PCBs too much, and a lot more pesticides, uh, but about the same in terms of the perfluorinated chemicals. So another way to look at this is to look at the chemicals that were detected. So let me just preface this. When we get these hits, there are some chemicals for which we find them in lots of different women, and there are some that we may find in one woman. You know, we get one hit in one person. So we wanted to see, well, what about the chemicals that we find are more prevalent across this, across this uh, small sample size? And so if we just focus on looking at those that are found 
that we get a hit in more than 25% of our population. Now, of course, it's 20, so that's more than five women, but or five or more women. You can see the breakdown right here. So when we were looking at um, of the 177 that are in our database, we're finding in five women or more, about 60 is 63, so about a third of these potential chemicals compared to 16 found in NHANES. The pesticides, while we have a relatively large database of pesticides, we find a smaller fraction of those more prevalently. Um, the phthalates and the metabolites is actually the one where we have 61 in our database, and we're finding 43 of these in at least five or more women in our sample. PFCs and then um, the total down here. So we, like I said, we have 729 candidate chemicals that we could be, uh, that we're scanning for. We find about 20% that are uh, identified in five or more women. So the other thing that we wanted to look at is, does, does the exposure profile matter? Because the exposure profile of the total chemicals that you are being exposed to will matter somewhat based on what you're looking for. So we, as I have mentioned, we have a database that is a little more heavily weighted towards pesticides. We have more pesticides in our database because of the availability of the source of information, though we find less of them relatively, relatively to the phenols. So in this case, you can see, um, again, we're finding a, a pretty, a, a predominantly on the phenols and the pesticides compared to the PFCs and the PBDEs. Whereas here, it's similar in terms of relative, relative to each other in the groups, but we're just seeing many more. Okay, so as I've said, we look to see, first we're looking what might be in there. Then we have to say, okay, now we want to go and confirm that what we're seeing is actually found in these biological samples. So we are going on to target a select number of these chemicals and then uh, uh, evaluate whether or confirm them and then, uh, and then identify the level using a targeted LCMS approach. So we used a some criteria to try and identify which chemicals we were going to select from those essentially 100 chemicals that we're finding in, in most of the women. Um, we wanted to look at those that are at least some chemicals that were identified in a high percentage of the samples. Also high use in commerce. So we're very interested in the, in the relationship between the chemicals that we find in the women and their prevalence of use in commerce. So because one thing that we're interested in is where do the chemicals come from? If just because we measure it in somebody, that doesn't give us any information about the source. So this can give us some information about the relationship between sources and uh, presence in people. Uh, persistence in bioaccumulation, uh, developmental toxin, um, and not measured in large biomonitoring studies. So here are the chemicals that we have are going to focus on for doing our confirmatory analysis. And um, n these, none of these are currently measured as part of NHANES. We have 2-sec-butylphenol, which we found in 16 women. This is primarily a pesticide source, though we can find in some other products. Uh, for nonylphenol, this may be familiar to some people. This is in a lot of consumer products, but also used in some types of pesticide uses. And then benzophenone 1, which is used in a lot of personal care products. Now, I did say that we were going to focus on um, chemicals that were uh, of high prevalence in our study population. And you're probably looking at benzophenone one thinking, well, that's only in five women. So a part of this, too, is that we will be able to look at the difference between the benzophenone one, which we have less detects, and uh, two sec butylphenol, which we have more detects. So this will give us a more idea about the, the uh, sensitivity and specificity of our TOF LCMS. So many of the chemicals that we have identified in here are not biomonitored by NHANES. And, and a large, I think some of the challenge for the current approaches to biomonitoring is it is very time intensive to develop the methods to actually measure the, the targeted chemicals. So um, 
it's just a, a different type of approach. You get different types of information, but it's challenging because we want to have more information about at least some ideas about the breadth of exposures that may be occurring in the population. And that we can use these non-targeted screening tools as a way to help us either prioritize new biomonitoring studies or to even identify ways to look at um, issues related to toxicity testing and, and uh, identifying potential chemicals that we may want to target in terms of future studies for uh, identifying hazards. This study is 20 women using uh, this new technology. Of course, it, that makes it a little limited because we have a relatively small population. We will be increasing the number to at least over 100. And our first step in this is to identify the usefulness and the and the utility of the of the tool, which we feel is uh, we've gotten a lot of really good information from this. And one of the challenges of this tool is we we are using it to measure what many people refer to, we say environmental chemicals, but also is referred to as small molecules. So we can't use it to really measure these other types of um, things like proteins, nucleic acids, et cetera. And it also doesn't measure metals, some gaseous compounds, and inorganic salts. So it, it, it measures many things, but not everything. And I think uh, that there's two sources that can influence the results we see. One is how the method of the analytic chemistry works in terms of how we ionize it and what gets ionized into different modes will influence which chemicals are more likely to appear as um, being identified as a hit in our sample. So when I talk about that we're looking at the chemicals that ionize in the negative mode, there are a whole bunch of chemicals that are in the positive mode, which we will not have, um, will have less sensitivity to identifying. So uh, poly, uh, many of the flame retardants kind of that are more not less polar. Um, organotins is another chemical. But if we are moving into looking at other modes, so a positive mode as well as other methods of ionization, that will help capture those other types of chemicals. The universe of chemicals is it's it, there's a lot of chemicals, and we're still s slowly expanding the database that will allow us to to match up and identify to identify these hits. And as I have discussed throughout this talk the data, th what we're looking for in our biological sample is somewhat influenced by what's in our database of masses. We find many more masses in these biological samples, but we're only able to match the ones that are in our chemosome database. So for example, certain things that are not in our chemosome database will not appear, but we have many pesticides in our chemosome database, so that may, over time, as we look through the various modes, influence uh, the number of pesticides we find. As I mentioned, the next steps for this is we're doing a confirmatory LCMS to uh, identify and measure the levels. We'll be expanding the sample size. We'll be looking at the other modes to see to capture the chemicals that don't appear well in this negative ionization mode. Um, and then I think the other thing that is important to think about to when we're looking at these chemical exposures in pregnant women is one of the questions that comes up is, well, now that we find all these chemicals, what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of potential increased risk for adverse health effects to the woman as well as her uh, future child? And so one thing that we are doing alongside this is collecting information through uh, new methodologies that we've developed to systematically uh, evaluate information about uh, environmental chemical exposures and their relationship to developmental effects through an evidence-based medicine approach that is adapted for environmental chemicals called the navigation guide. So we can have a methodology that gives us the information about what we know about the relationship between the environmental chemical exposure and the adverse health outcomes so that when we find these chemicals, we'll be able to say, we know, or we have this type of information to tell us what is the likelihood that that may be causing a develop, may be related to a developmental effect. This is our attempt at the schematic of the targeted versus non-targeted. So in the targeted, you have a rat. And so your cat may look through the hole and try and identify the rat. But in the non-targeted, we're going to the source and like looking across all the rats and see if we can get them at once, not the chemicals are rats. Thank you. Thank you.